a very good evening to everybody uh, yeah there we are uh, so uh, why why do you uh, uh, what was the felt need for adas uh, that would be the first point which i'll be discussing in this presentation um, i will be by the way what is adas adas is advanced uh, driver assistance systems and uh, we we will see what are the various levels of adas uh, level 0 to level 5 uh, as i can uh, tell you in the next uh, bullet point over here what are the five pillars of autonomous driving in case uh, somebody is interested of uh, you know sometimes uh, let's assume that uh, you all decide hey we want to make uh, an autonomous driving car so what all do you need to do again very very simple if i leave uh, uh, a few of your ladies and gentlemen in a room uh, you yourself will come out with exactly what uh, i'll be teaching uh, or i'll be talking about uh, with you in the next uh, few minutes obviously the next question uh, ladies and gentlemen is uh, what is the skill set required in case uh, the youngsters want to uh, make a career in adas a very very brief overview of what the robo operating system is yes at the outset let me tell you ladies and gentlemen it's not an operating system uh, that's a misnomer uh, we will see what exactly it is uh, what is the sensor fit of a typical car uh, and then uh, there are some extra slides and uh, time permitting uh, and if the audience uh, shows uh, some interest then i'll take you to the next part of my presentation and that is what is uh, hardware in loop testing um every few minutes uh, i'll be asking uh, professor shirish mane whether uh, he can see my video and he can see my screen or not yes. so uh, professor mane uh, is it fine yes sir working fine great uh, i hope my audio is okay uh, do i need to make any changes no 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 it's 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 great okay right thank you um so uh, as i said uh, the first thing would be why adas uh, there is this report which is there uh, the references for the report are given below and uh, in 2014 it's a report of the united states of america that there were more than 30000 traffic related fatalities people had died more than 30000 people died there were about 2.3 million injuries and about 6.1 million reported collisions and you'll be shocked to know that 94% of these uh, accidents and injuries and collisions were attributable to driver error it's it's a big number but it's it's the truth 94% and out of that uh, 31% involved uh, intoxicated drivers obviously intoxicated drivers is absolutely uh, a mistake of the driver itself and 10% uh, was from distracted drivers so this made the scientific community sit up of course it has work on it has was already going on but this particular report somehow gave the confidence to the scientific community in that yes what they are doing is the right thing and we need to start looking at adas uh, in a very more uh, in a much more uh, focused manner uh, by the way uh, this uh, report was published by uh, the national highway traffic uh, safety administration you know the short form we all know it uh, it is nhtsa of the united states of america uh, before i go ahead so what have i done i have just talked to you what was the fake news before i go ahead i will just tell you a representative uh, list of uh, adas features the kind of features which we find on cars and so on and so forth like there is adaptive cruise control adaptive cruise control that the names are very very intuitive i mean you don't even need me to explain to you so for example adaptively where i can control my speed we all know since the last so many years there is this cruise control which is this you set a speed on the car using a small button and you are on a highway so you are traveling from bombay to pune and then you set a particular speed and the car will keep going on that particular speed say 120 km h or 80 km you can put your you can remove your leg uh, from the from the foot pedal from the accelerator pedal it will keep going at 80 km that's normal cruise control but here we are talking about adaptive cruise control what if the car in the front is slowing down so will your car slow down from the set speed of 80 km h to say 60 or 40 or no and when that particular car has again sped up will it increase speed from 40 to the set speed of 80 km so that is adaptive cruise control so i will at this point i'll pause for a couple of minutes and i would like you uh, the audience to kindly look at, to have a look at the at the representative list of adas features which are flashed in the screen on the screen for for you
what you can do ladies and gentlemen the the whole lot of youngsters who are there that you can go to the you can go to wikipedia and just possibly type one of these features and you will get a lot of information about that or you can go to youtube and see these kind of features which have already been implemented by the leading uh, oems of the world what is oem original equipment manufacturers like for example the hondas the toyotas the all these uh, the ford the mitsubishis all these people all these companies who make the cars they are called oems in our terminology by the way talking about terminology uh, professor mani uh, that uh, we um, kpit per se is sometimes a tier 1 and sometimes a tier 2 as what's a tier 1 company tier 1 company is a company which actually makes systems directly for the oem so many times we have projects where we are directly talking to honda we are directly talking to toyota so on and so forth tier 2 is something a company which actually first uh, talks to a tier 1 or, or develops a product for the tier 1 and then the tier 1 is actually talking to the original equipment manufacturer coming to the uh, coming to the next uh, slide what are the levels of adas uh, by the way these six levels of adas were outlined in the sae uh, document number j3016 uh, document and uh, what is level 0 level 0 is nothing but uh, you know the driver controls it all the steering the brakes the throttle it's something which you have been doing all along a uh, one second just just i'll just pause for a moment sorry uh, there was some uh, background noise so i thought i'll go and, and tell the family members to kindly say some uh, yeah okay so uh, that is what you've been doing all along as you can see on the screen and uh, only alerts are issued by the system for example what you already have in your cars that you when you put your you know gear lever into reverse and in case your car is going towards an obstacle then there is this beeping sound which comes on your infotainment console then we go to level 1 level 1 is uh, most of the functions are still controlled by the driver but a specific function either lateral or longitudinal function when i say lateral i meaning left and right motion longitudinal is front and back motion is done automatically like right? like for example i was i was uh, i was lucky to be working on a feature for uh, jaguar land rover and that feature was automatic park assist now there there was only automatic steering so you are entering a uh, you are ex you are entering a parking lot and the moment you enter a parking lot you are like uh, you know uh, keeping your hands uh, of the steering and uh, the vehicle is going straight into the parking lot right it has ultrasonic sensors six sensors in the front six sensors at the rear these sensors are sensing whether there are empty parking spaces number one and whether these parking spaces are wide enough for your uh, car to get in if it realizes it is then it stops and then it gives you an alert on your infotainment panel it's called the infotainment panel and then you are expected to either put the gear lever forward or rear and the moment you change the position of the forward or reverse here and then you are expected to press the pedal and then automatically it will take you back right so as i said the the left and right motion was done by the car but you were expected to uh, you know change the gear or gear lever and you were expected to press the accelerator so this is the park assist but level 1 now the same feature ladies and gentlemen can be a level 2 feature so the feature is same but here the car will do both the left and right motion as well as the forward and reverse motion what is level 3 adas level 3 driver is still necessary but it is the but the driver is able to shift most of the safety critical critical functions to the vehicle however there is a small uh, small disclaimer only under certain traffic conditions 
Say for example, to give you an example, you want to go from say uh, from Shivaji Nagar in Pune up to Worli in Bombay, right? So you know that when you're starting from Shivaji Nagar in Pune, you have to go to the beginning of the expressway. Now till that place, till that point in the expressway, the driver can drive. But the moment you are on the expressway, then the, then the vehicle can be fully automatic. Everything will be done by, by the way. But up to where? Not up to early. Again, up to the end of the expressway. And then the moment the expressway gets over, you have to again, the driver has to again come uh, and start operating the vehicle. Right? So under certain traffic or environmental condition. That's the key word over here. But otherwise, it's fully automatic. Right? Coming to level four, level four autonomy, again, fully automatic. However, driver is still present in the car. You have to have him. The, the automatic system can perform all safety critical functions and monitor roadway conditions for the entire trip, right from Shivaji Nagar in Pune up to Worli in Bombay. The driver can, you know, possibly play with his child. He, can, or he or she can work on the computer, watch movies, so on and so forth. But in case there is a condition wherein the system feels that the system cannot handle the situation, there will be an alert issue and the driver is expected to take over in the next five or 10 seconds. So that is, uh, that is an important point to, to consider. However, in a level five uh, ADAS, uh, ADAS car, everything is automatic. In fact, you don't even have a driver, you don't even have a steering wheel. So your grandmother, she, she orders, orders a car on her app and the car comes to her doorstep and there is no driver. She just sits and she goes away, right? That's what the, the holy grail of autonomous driving, if I may say. Uh, coming back, uh, coming to the next. Uh, so I'll, I'll just go back and uh, pause here for about 30 seconds. I will wait for the audience to, uh, to understand what is level three, level four, level five. And uh, I will also go and show you what is level zero, level one, and level two. Right. Coming back to the next, so what have I covered till now? Not much. I have talked to you about what is the felt need for ADAS. Uh, and then I've talked about the six levels of ADAS, starting from level zero up to level five. Now, as I said, what if a few of you youngsters decide that, hey, we need to make uh, an autonomous driving system. Then what I would do is that I would just ask you to close your eyes for a moment and just imagine that when you are driving a car, what exactly are you doing, right? So obviously, whatever you are doing, you are expecting a system to do that, is it not? So what are you doing? First of all, you're sensing. Your eyes are there who are sensing what is there on the road. Your ears are there, you're hearing what is happening around you, right? So these are the, primarily these are the two organs, uh, two sense organs which we are using, our eyes and our ears. And then there is a whole lot of processing which takes place in your brain. Your brain, since childhood, is able to correlate what your eyes see with what you hear, right? So you are able to make out that, yes, okay, I see that particular car which is honking. So I can hear the honk and I can see the car. So that is that particular car because your ears are also able to localize. We know that, that our ears are able to localize whether the sound is coming from here or it is here. Even if you close your eyes, you can localize the source of sound. So the first step is sensing, which now you expect your system to do. And also sensing, you have a host of sensors. We'll talk about the sensors. The sensing has to be done in a time synchronized manner and the data has to be fused. Your brain does it automatically for you. It does the fusion of what the eyes are seeing and what the ears are listening, your ears are listening, right? But here, now you expect the particular system to do that. To give you an example, you have a camera mounted on your car and the camera is seeing a particular backside of the uh, the backside of a particular vehicle your radar is also seeing that particular object you know that the radar and the camera work very differently so the radar is also able to detect that particular target now you require a system which is able to fuse or combine the information 
coming from the radar and coming from the camera and give that one information to the central processing computer or in our language we call we have to generate one composite information plot to the central processing computer now this central processing computer knows all the targets all the pedestrian targets all the stationary targets all the moving targets which are around the vehicle the keyword here ladies and gentlemen composite information plot or cip as we call it in our uh, in our language one is you know sensing the information another thing is perception how do you make sense out of the information i just mentioned about the com uh, common information plot or the composite information plot another level uh, another level of perception is for example uh, you have uh, done uh, you know you have uh, you have uh, done a lot of miles in a car and you know that say for example if there is a boy on the side of the road there's a very high probability of that boy running in front of your car compared to if there is a man or compared to if even if there is a old man who is walking on the side of the road so a man walking on the side of the road very high probability of he coming in front of your car an old man reasonably high probability uh, 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 the man very low probability or uh, an old man a uh, reasonably high prob uh, probability but a child has got a very very high probability that it can come in front of your car right so this is uh, all in the domain of perception localization very simply where am i and what and who is around me planning as we all do long term planning you want to go from place a to place b you 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 decide that you know i will take that particular street i will take a right on that intersection and so on and so forth from my location to that particular destination that is long term planning short term planning hey i can see your car there i can see your car here and there is a little path which is a possible which i can just navigate and go that's called short term planning right obviously you have to control because here it's an automatic car subject to known constraints why am i using the word say for example you are in a in a small car say a uh, say a hatchback so you know what is the power available in a hatchback compared to a situation that you are in a truck or compared to a situation that you are in a sports car right so what actions you have to take or what actions you can take also depends upon the type of the vehicle on which this autonomous system is getting implemented say you are implementing an autonomous system in a in a truck which is carrying a load of 20 tons so obviously you know that my stopping distance will be very very large so i the central computer have to give that information to the brakes much more in advanced compared to if this autonomous system is being ported onto a small hatchback because a hatchback is less than 1 ton and it can stop immediately but a 20 ton truck uh, a 20 ton truck will take a lot of time before it can go and stop the next part under control uh, process series is how can i react to changing situations as drivers we do that how can i react to changing situations that's the keyword that's called object and event detection and response object and event i am able to detect the objects and the events and how do i respond to them so before i go ahead i will stop here for about 30 seconds and i would like you to just look at these five pillars of adas Professor Shirish, may I go ahead, please? Yes, sir. Please, please go ahead. Okay, I'm sure the young audience would be keen to know that. Hey, Shishir, we are uh, 
we are very excited because especially now you've told us what the five pillars of ADAS is all about. And hey, it's all very simple. I mean, <laughs> uh, what's new you're talking about? And I, and I agree, you know, uh, if you had uh, devoted about half an hour to this, you yourself would have come out. Yeah, I mean, we're required to know all this. I mean, we're required to do all this in an autonomous car. So fine, we understood that. Now, what do we need to do? If we want to make our own uh, ADAS uh, or an automated car, autonomous car. So this is the square required uh, skill set. I'm sure you would have already understood that, uh, you know, you, you need to have a very strong background of calculus, of linear algebra, of probability theory, estimation theory, and deep learning. You can have a, a, a slight uh, prefatory exposure. You should know what deep learning is all about. You should know what estimation theory is all about. Uh, of course, there are programs, there are various libraries which you can, you can you know, exploit. But you should at least know what do these various things do. Newtonian mechanics, very important, right? Fundamentals of control systems, obviously. You are designing a control system, so obviously you should be clear about Fourier transforms, Laplace transforms, continuous and discrete time signals in systems, and linear time invariant system analysis should be very clear, very clear to you. Embedded system design, you've already created um, an algorithm, ladies and gentlemen, in MATLAB, but now uh, you know uh, you have to finally port it onto a standalone processor, right? So you should know how can I optimize and port it onto my processor. For all you know, you have made a very, very good algorithm in MATLAB code or uh, processing. But what if that particular algorithm takes a lot of time to execute on this standalone processor? Then what do you do? You have to have multiple iterations of approximations. Right, and then you have to see that hey, I have done this particular approximation so that it runs in near real time on this target processor. But whether this approximation is it allowed or is it not allowed? Whether it's going to result in a crash or a suboptimal performance, right? So, this is where your knowledge about embedded system design comes. In. Very good, uh, very good uh, C coding skills because. The code which you've written in MATLAB or C++ that has to be ported uh, onto, onto a standalone processor. Exposure to robo operating system and uh, very good communication skills. I mean, uh, I'm so thankful to Professor Shirish that he has given me this opportunity to speak to these young uh, boys and girls. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of these boys and girls, they join our, our company. And this is one thing which, uh, which our people are really lacking, I don't know why, is that they have very poor communication skills. They are just not able to communicate their thoughts. And I've been told that uh, the audience is uh, second year students and that's the right time for sessions that you could have uh, you know, introduced me to them. I would really request all of you that you have to improve your communication. This is the time, you have to take it on a war footing you have to be able to speak in good English and be able to talk to each other and communicate with each other. Marathi media bol lo tar German cha German cha manchala Marathi itne ro. Tena nuste English hai the. ठीक है. Sir, अच्छा French manchala Marathi hai the. Tena nuste English hai the. Excuse me, sir. Only uh, English. Yeah. We have participants from around sixteen states. Go yeah. Ahead. So yeah, I was I was just trying to speak in a vernacular language and trying to tell my people that you need to work, start working on it right now. I mean, you have to take it on a war footing. Do whatever it takes. I I keep telling my people that even when you're talking to your friends or you're talking to your roommate, you please speak in English. I mean, uh, that's all I can because sorry, I am stressing this point a bit too much. A never give up attitude. Now you will look at these so many points which I have written on top, and you might wonder, oh my God. I don't know this, I don't know that, you know, and uh, what is uh, Dr. Shishir telling us? I'm just not able to do all this, but don't worry. You, you, you are in a generation wherein everything is at the tip of your fingers. There are such beautiful videos on any topic. It's just that you need to have that particular desire in your heart that come what may, I am going to understand this. I often give this example, Professor Shirish, that, you know, I have these youngsters who come, uh, even people who have joined uh, my organization and they come to me. And just to give an example, I ask them that, hey, do you know how to take out the minima or the maxima of a curve? They, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, we know how to do that and they will do it and they will solve it and show it. But if you ask them, 
that hey why did you do this or why did you check whether the double derivative is negative or positive and why is it uh, you know that uh, for a double derivative uh, for a negative double derivative it's it's a it's a maxima and other way around for a minima we will not be able to answer such a simple question they will not be able to answer why because they have stopped asking why they know how to do things but they don't know why they are doing it that's the biggest problem and then you can never be an innovator you will just be a follower you can never create anything new because to create anything new you need to have an intersection of two domains only then you can innovate another example which i give professor shirish you know i give a question on double integration they will be able to solve you know in in next 10 15 minutes but if i ask them that what does that double integration convey to you nobody i can use the word nobody nobody knows what is the meaning of that double integration you know maths is nothing but a language you know you have to learn the 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 grammar of the language if you don't any equation given in front of you is a is a long and beautiful story you have to understand that story the moment you understand the story believe you me professor mani i do not i do not mug up any equations why very simply because i have understood the story you go and watch a movie do you need to mug up the story of the movie no you have to just internalize it the moment you internalize it you can tell the story of the movie to anybody that is what a mathematical equation is all about right i know i am devoting a lot of time on this particular uh, slide it is because i want the youngsters to understand that anything is possible if openheim can write a book of 1000 pages on signals and systems you and me can definitely understand it another example ask yourself questions that when fourier transforms were already existing why did mr laplace uh, invent the laplace transform you look at an equation say for example you know if x of t has this x of f and if you do x of t minus tau then x of f becomes x of f e raised to minus j 2 pi f tau ask yourself why does it become like that and that is where i feel that you know my my boys and girls are lacking and this is the most appropriate time for them to sit up and they have to realize that hey i am an engineer i am just not a follower please do that and uh, anyway uh, let me not uh, take too much of your time on this particular slide i will go ahead and what have we covered till now we've covered the felt need for adas we've talked about the uh, five levels of adas we talked about a very important slide where we talked about the five pillars of adas sensing perception localization control and uh, yeah sensing perception localization control and i'm sorry <laughs> i forgot yeah there you are yeah planning yeah how could i forget planning so it's same thing perception localization planning and control right so these are the five pillars of adas and let's go ahead and uh, yes uh, if you have to make an autonomous car then obviously you need to have good team team skills uh, so so divide your job and do what right uh what is the robo operating system as i mentioned right in the beginning uh, uh professor shirish that it is not an operating system yeah the name is a misnomer it is basically a global collaborative initiative so the keywords have been underlined uh, professor shirish it's a collaborative global initiative to reuse your existing hardware components and software components and drivers and proven software code whether it can be a c++ code or python for what for various functionalities so fusion code is already there hey i have data coming from different different sensors how can i synchronize them don't worry the code the proven code is already already there so you are not wasting your time it's like you know if i may use the word the difference between matlab code and and a c code right what is matlab matlab is nothing but a rich a very rich library of some i think 20000 functions so you are not kind of reinventing the wheel you just pick up read solomon coder it's there you just pick up kalman filter it is there you just pick up unscented kalman filter somebody has done the dirty work 
of writing that code and proving that that code works. That is the similar thing about the robo operating system. What it does, it compresses your development cycles. Apart from that, it has the various following features. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here uh, for about 60 seconds so that audience can read what is there on the, on the, on the screen, and then I'll go ahead. Right. In fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have shared these slides with uh, Professor Mani, and uh, so I, I believe that he's nothing. also reading the chat. Uh, generally, I, I request the uh, expert to just concentrate on the slides and not the chat. But uh, right, uh, like rightly you said, I will share these slides with all the participants tomorrow, because I believe many people are also writing down or taking notes. So I request all the participants, you can concentrate on the slides and what sir is delivering. And uh, tomorrow we'll get a copy because uh, in fact, you are the first expert to share uh, the presentation with me. So tomorrow's email, I'll send them these presentations. Yeah, time. yeah. I mean, absolutely. And uh, it's it's kind of my passion, uh, Professor Mani, that, you know, uh, I, I, I would like to spread the message amongst the, uh, amongst the youngsters. And uh, but all these things which I taught, in fact, uh, I'm realizing that I am also at home and my daughter is also at home and you know, she uh, she's troubling me with a lot of fundamentals of maths. So I don't know, possibly I, <laughs> I might start a channel yeah. where I will be covering all mathematical uh, topics in linear algebra and probability theory and uh, you know, differentiation. Yeah, yeah, that could be, that could be let's hope. No promises. <laughs> Nothing has been done. Uh, but let's see. Yes, sir. I don't know. Whether I'll be able to take out time or not. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. In fact, I mean, on a, on a lighter note, I, I even go to colleges and I, and I meet the teachers in mathematics, mathematics teachers and all, and I, and I teach them as to how they should teach mathematics so that, you know, uh, the, the kids are able to appreciate in a much better manner, whether you talk about 11th standard or 12th standard, even in very good schools, Professor Sirish, I mean, uh, this the way maths is taught, is, I, I really don't appreciate the way it is taught. Anyway, yeah. or even for that matter, you know, engineering yeah. subjects, yeah. some places yeah. is really taught in a, in a manner which really requires a lot of improvement. Anyway, we would let's not uh, go on to that particular path. Let's get back to our, uh, our, our slides here. So uh, we talked about what are the sensors. I know there was a passing mention about what are the various sensors. So there are a lot of external sensors. When I say external, it means they are sensing what is external to the to the to the vehicle, to the car. Uh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, also remember that when you say car, uh, I may use the word car, but you have to expand your thinking, ladies and gentlemen, and imagine drones also. In fact, there is a lot of thought process which is happening in the industry. Professor Shirish, is that possibly the industry should have looked at drones a lot earlier, yes. right? Is it not? Yes. Because that's yes. going to happen. Drones are going to come in. So please do not restrict yourself Restrict yourself only to cars. Please, ladies and gentlemen, start looking at drones. And I, you will definitely have the uh, first mover advantage if you start looking at drones right away rather than autonomous cars. Okay. So what are the, what are the external sensors? Uh, uh, sensors, a group of sensors, ladies and gentlemen, which, which rely on the radiation of an electromagnetic signal into the environment. Please remember radio waves, right? We all know what are radio waves, but re remember that light is also an electromagnetic radiation. It's just that the frequencies happen to be in a range which can be sensed by our eyes, right? So when I say talk about electromagnetic signals, I mean light also, I mean laser also, right? And that is why uh, you, you can see lidars. Lidars are nothing but lasers. Some terminology, so when I, when I talk about radiation of electromagnetic signal, sorry, I'm repeating, I mean radars. So you send a pulse of, of radio energy or electromagnetic energy, that pulse, a small short burst, if I may say, like this, 
goes into the environment it hits if there is a target it hits the target and then it comes back to you so you know you know the speed of light or you know the speed of your uh, electromagnetic signal in the environment the two way travel time has been recorded by you you know the distance again uh, that's how bats navigate in in the caves of course they do not use radars they are using what are known as sound waves and you know the difference between radars uh, between electromagnetic signal and and sound signal sound signals require a medium either air or water or solids to propagate whereas electromagnetic signals do not we have electromagnetic signals coming from the distant galaxies we have sun sunlight coming from the sun wherein there is vacuum all between the earth and the sun but still we can have those um, radio signals or light signals coming to us some terms what is azimuth azimuth is where it is with respect to the heading 30 degrees right 30 degrees left so on and so forth uh, what is bearing bearing is again uh, angle or uh, azimuth what is elevation elevation is this how much it is up what is range range is this the shortest distance between you and the target relative velocity clustering etc right again i'm just throwing some terms at you uh we talked about uh, we talked about uh, radars and lidars uh, ladies and gentlemen we talk uh, now what i'm talking about i'm talking about acoustic signals i just mentioned acoustic signals require an environment right but if those signals are within our audio range everybody will get disturbed is it not so in cars what we use is ultrasonic signals the, the frequencies are very high we cannot hear it right that's the only difference but otherwise it's a sound signal at heart cameras you have a camera which is mounted many cameras in fact uh, processor is you know and the front camera is typically a stereoscopic camera i hope you know what's a monocular camera and what's a stereoscopic camera stereoscopic camera is like our eyes there are two cameras right they look at the same object and because they look at the same object little differently the left eye and the right eye sees it differently you are able to get a judgment of depth i'm sure you must have felt sometime in your life that if you know for example if you hurt your eye if you put an eye mask on that that particular eye and if you try to play cricket you'll never be able to play good cricket why because you will just not be able to judge just uh, just the depth of the ball so we get a vision or a feeling of depth just because we have two eyes right obviously all these cars are connected to the gps they have connectivity with a my uh, with a mobile phone right and uh, they are also connected to a central server at this point uh, professor shirish i would really like to talk about a very interesting feature which was there on a jaguar uh, car and that was uh, say for example if you are stuck up on a on a hilly road and you have to negotiate a very tight curve and you are scared that hey i will not be able to negotiate that tight curve on this hilly road you can actually get out of the car and you are establishing a wifi connection with your vehicle on your mobile phone and you are actually seeing what the camera the top camera is seeing in the front of the car and you are able to like james bond you know you are able to negotiate your car through that tight spot right so here you are in the middle of the forest there is no connectivity to the internet nothing is there no mobile communication nothing is there but you have been able to establish a, a wifi link between your car and your mobile phone and that is what i am trying to tell and then yes obviously your car also is connected to the central server of the manufacturer and a whole lot of data is getting uh, sent to that central server and those that data ladies and gentlemen is utilized for many things more more importantly hey when is the next servicing due hey this parameter of this particular engine we are consistently seeing is very very high so there is something wrong with your engine you please you know the earliest time please go to a particular uh, service station and get your engine checked so on and so forth as we call it preventive maintenance right so lot of lot of things are possible in fact they are happening uh, what i talked about till now was all the external sensors if you can see on the top part the bottom part we are talking about the internal sensors which are there on the wheel the wheel speed sensor the yaw rate sensor the tilt sensor you know whether your car is like this or whether the car is like this the steering wheel angle sensor what is yaw rate sensor yeah by the way i should tell you what is yaw Yaw is this motion of the car. Roll is this motion of the car. 
and which is this motion of the car. Right? So here we are talking about the your aid sensor. Now you might, and it's required. I mean, just just uh, to take a digression at this point, when does the driver know, or when does the car know when the car is skidding? He comes to know when the car is skidding because there are two inputs coming to the car processor series. One is the your aid sensor. This input is coming to the to the computer, and the other is from the steering wheel angle. So if this angle and this angle is not correlated in a certain manner the car comes to know that, hey, the car is skidding, right? So, so many interesting things are there. I mean, uh, one hour would be a very less time uh, to discuss so many things which are there. But again, as I said, it's no rocket science, right? Four of you will sit down together. You will come out with all this, uh, uh, all this uh, knowledge which I'm talking about. Uh, I think at this particular uh, slide, I can go a little fast. Again, yeah, I, I would really like to take this point and discuss with you that don't think that anything, uh, everything and anything which is there on the internet is right. Like for example, um, how the elect electromagnetic field propagates, there is an E field vector and there's an H field vector. And we know uh, that they are out of phase by 90 degrees. However, if you see the diagram on the right hand side, it's showing that the E field vector and the H field vector, they are in phase. So I, I was really amazed just to see that even on the internet, there is a whole lot of, you know, uh, wrong and misleading information, which is there. Uh, this slide, this diagram on the left-hand side is very interesting. I mean, uh, somebody from the audience could have asked me uh, that Commander Shishir, why is uh, 77 gigahertz is the frequency which is being chosen for the radar of the car? And the answer is right here. See, if you can see, what is on the x-axis? Sorry. The x-axis is the frequency in gigahertz. So this is 10 gigahertz. It's a logarithmic scale. And this is 100 gigahertz. This is the attenuation because of oxygen in the environment. Attenuation of what, ladies and gentlemen? The electromagnetic signal, which is going from the radar. You know how a radar operates. It emits a burst and it comes back. So here, there is a nice little dip. So that means around these frequencies, the attenuation is quite low. And that is what the engineers have, uh, have realized it. And that's why they decided that yes, all the automotive, uh, all the automotive uh, radars will operate at around 77 to 80 gigahertz of frequency, right? So that is why, that is what I, I, I meant. That always keep asking questions. Why 77? Why not 60? Why not 50? And that's the reason. See, this is, this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. If you end up using 60 gigahertz, you're using a very, very bad frequency because the attenuation because of atmospheric oxygen is the highest over there. Right. Now let's, you know, uh, one part of the whole, uh, whole process of learning is, you know, just reading books and blah, blah, blah. Another part is, how can you actually get down and doing things? And that is where the different professors of the different colleges come into play or the group of colleges can get together. That hey, let's have some competitions. In fact, you'll be shocked to know that it is the DARPA challenge, uh, which I think started in 2006, which resulted in so much of development in autonomous driving. So the last 14 years, every year, there would be big, big colleges, the Stanford's and the MIT's and the you know, big, big colleges of the universities of the world would take part in these challenges. And that's how year on year, year on year, they have really been uh, amazing improvements in the field of autonomous training. So one, some projects, uh, suggestions or challenges, if you can say, is this remote part, uh, remote control parking of a car, right? So, you know, it's as if uh, uh, there is a room in which uh, some kind of a sand model has been made and the people are connected to their car over a link, over a wireless link. And uh, you cannot see the car because you are in a different room, but you can see what the camera on the car can, can see. Okay. And you are expected that you know how you are able to park these cars uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a parking lot. Right. So that is what I'm saying. Aim is to accomplish n number of remote parkings in a physical sand model or a miniature racetrack. Remote control is in a nearby visually opaque but RF transparent enclosure. You can use combination of ultrasonic sensors and one camera and remote control should preferably be over Wi-Fi or 4G. 
and the team taking the least time is the winner. In fact, Professor Shirish, I can also tell at that at this stage that there is a very strong user case of having control of cars over 4G or 5G. So if your students can work on how using 5G technology, of course, unfortunately, 5G is not yet rolled out, but somehow if you can have it in a lab setup, I don't know whether that's possible or not. So how over 4G or 5G we can use, we can do, uh, we can do remote control of a car. Say for example, another challenge which you can have uh, amongst a group of colleges, autonom autonomously traversing from one point to another in a known region. Right? So the, the map of the, of the surroundings or of that so-called miniature racetrack uh, has already been given to the participants and they've been given three, four months to work on it. And what are they expected to do? That finally their, their vehicle will be placed in that area it's a sand model. Sand model means all these blocks and everything are there, right? And using a combination of ultrasonic sensors and rudimentary camera, you leave the car anywhere in that sand model and the car is able to reach a particular destination on its own. Very interesting. Why? <laughs> because, you know, you will have data fusion, you will have control, you have image processing. So many things the kids will learn while they are trying to prepare for this particular competition. Right. Another thing that hey, okay, fine. I had given you the entire model of the other or the or the plan view of this particular uh, 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 race track, and now while the car is traversing, we will have some unknown objects, you know, dynamically moving around in that space. And now you are expected to still, in spite of these, uh, you know, pedestrians going around or other cars going around you are supposed to go from one position to the final destination, something like that. Okay. Yes. So, uh, you know, you might wonder, my God, uh, so many things uh, Commander Shishir has talked about. Uh, what next? You know, he talked about uh, one should be good in maths and Newtonian mechanics and algebra and so on and so forth. And if Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms, blah, blah, blah. But what should be the starting point, right? Uh, I would say uh, that fortunately for us, uh, there are very beautiful videos which have been made uh, by University of Tor Toronto as part of Coursera. And it is there on the internet. And if you guys, if the uh, boys and girls can can go there and start looking at uh, these uh, these videos, I think that would be very good. You know, one minute, please. Just a minute. So uh, since I'm sharing these PowerPoint slides with you, I can you can have a look at it. That what these uh, different uh, videos are are all about, and uh, you know you will understand. My God, it's really been structured very very well. At this point, I would also like to tell you that you know uh, it's always advisable if you sit down together and always work. Whether you're watching a video or you're solving sums or anything, what you're doing, it's always advisable that you sit down and study together, work together. Because you you will keep asking questions to each other and in the on the and simultaneously you'll become good communicators also. And uh, there is a there is a there is a saying in Hindi. It says ek aur ek I I really uh, feel very very strongly. Even at office, I insist, uh, Professor Mane, that my teams always work together. And not only me. And where did I see it? I saw it at BMW when I was at Munich at BMW, even they insist pair working, pair programming. They do not have a system where people are sitting alone and working. They're always working in pairs or they're working in mobs. That is the way uh, the, the, the big, big companies of the world are working together. Okay. I think uh, these are the extra slides. They are there with you and uh, kindly go through them. And what we'll do, Professor Shirish, is that I think uh, today uh, there has been uh, Again, it's my fault that, uh, or rather I would play, uh, blame it on Mr. Murphy, who ensured that my Outlook also doesn't work, who ensured that my Gmail also doesn't work, and I ended up 15 minutes late. Yeah. Luckily, my daughter was hanging around, so I could at least log into the presentation. Yes. But what I will suggest is that uh, this topic of hardware and loop testing, hill testing, is quite a big one. And 
it can't happen in the next 15 20 minutes so i'll pause over here and uh, we can share some questions if there are any questions um, we we will we will have a look at those uh, before i even go there very quickly i will just go to the first slide so that uh, the audience has a very quick revision of what uh, we what i covered as you can see the second part was hardware in loop testing what was the felt need for adas a representative list of some adas features the five pillars of autonomous driving what is the robo operating system example of external sensors the radars the lidars how a radar and a lidar is nothing but an electromagnetic signal how an electromagnetic signal doesn't require any medium whereas an acoustic signal that is sound waves do require a medium cameras gps mobile connectivity wifi connectivity internal sensors i took a use case for process series uh, that how using these internal sensors you are able to actually find out just as an example that whether my car is skidding is not or not skidding why 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 <laughs> keep asking and something to generate interest uh, amongst the audience and you know while they are working on a problem statement or on a competition i'm sure you know their progress while learning will be much faster and these are the extra slides uh, i know i didn't devote much time to that but uh, you can just go through this and uh, you'll understand right so i i stop at this stage and